And so when we decided, right, we think we want to work together, we decided to test it with trial by fire. Let's not just, you know, see what this does and whether it peters out. We rented out our house, started the business and took a one-way ticket to Bali. And we spent a year traveling around Southeast Asia and bootstrapping this business. Um, And if you want to test whether you can handle being with someone (laughs) 24-7, go get dengue fever when you've got a client project due. Go travel through the night to find that the place you were going to rent doesn't exist. Mm. Um, You know, put yourself into like culture shock in Cambodia while you're trying to build a business. And that, that extreme set of circumstances, by the time we came back a year later with a fledgling business... We, we'd put ourselves through so much of the stress that running it at home is really, really comfortable. You know, it's easy. Hello and welcome back to Building. In this episode, we interview Penny Pickering of Carbo Creative. Penny, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Penny was a great um, guest on the podcast and we had a good interview talking about three main areas, the marketing meetup, networking tips which both me and Harry need and also uh, Penny's growth journey with her wife Jo um, into setting up and and working on Cabo Creative. Enjoy. Penny, we met, well kind of met, you were busy running the Northampton Marketing Meetup, the third edition at the back end of last year. Uh, whilst me and Harry were kind of backing ourselves up into a Hiding in a wall. corner, yes. Yes, yes so... Um, Tell me, tell me a bit more about the marketing meetup to start up, start off with. So the marketing meetup is a meetup for marketers. It's brilliantly named, um, and the idea behind it, it was set up by a lovely chap called Joe. And Joe is a little bit introverted, he won't mind me saying, and he wasn't massively comfortable at networking events that he went to. He didn't feel completely comfortable there, and I can massively relate to that. I have hidden in the toilets at more networking events than you can imagine over my time. Um, And so the marketing meetup was started with a very simple principle of it should be a safe place for marketers to come together, find their peers and feel super comfortable in doing so. And so that, yep, that's the principle behind it. Nice. And why Northampton? So I, both Joe and I studied at the University of Northampton. Joe is Northamptonshire born and bred. Um, And we moved back to the county last year. And when we moved back to the county, we didn't want to stop going to the marketing meetup because it's something that really brought value to us and that we really enjoyed. And we felt like it was something that could really do some good here. So we chose to bring it back with us. Nice. And it's a bit like mine and yours journey, like obviously, Penny, you're on our podcast. And we we invest a lot of time in this podcast, don't we? And Mm. it's obviously you're busy running your own uh, agency like we are but this is like almost a is it a side gig is it a side hustle yeah would i call it a side hustle so it's unpaid completely voluntary okay. it's not like we're part of the marketing meetup we're very much volunteer event hosts which all of the events are um so there is time taken out of the business in order to run it but much like you're choosing to run a podcast there's benefits that come alongside doing that kind of thing um so yeah it's it's unpaid time out of the office but it's actually unpaid time that i really enjoy out of the office mm. and it adds something to my business life um and and that's why we choose yeah. to do it so you very kindly jumped into our studio um today on the day of the fourth kind of installment of the marketing meetup in northampton what does a day like this usually entail for you so we get up and desperately look at our ticket sales with all the nervousness <laughs> that comes with running an event oh my god how many have we got have we beaten the last month have mm. we not um and then we plan out our drinks and our pizza order so that we can keep everyone happy when they get here and then we rock over to the event space which is Vulcan Works in Northampton which is this stunning amazing space that happened to open its doors around about the same time we wanted to run to the event um, and move some chairs in some rooms, get the slides working, do all the audio testing, just like you guys do for your podcast, um, get the speaker in nice and early, and then welcome people into the event. Nice. So it's the, it's the fourth one tonight, but what, was the, what were your nerves like on the first one? Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Ooh, I was petrified. So yeah. we've been attending the marketing meetup since its second ever event, when it was this tiny thing in a canteen in an office somewhere. Um, and we've watched its growth. And to decide to do our own one, honestly, when I was pitching the venue space and the sponsors, I was thinking, if we don't get the people in, are we even going to get to run this again? So I was pitching it to them saying there might be 20. 
you know, but we will grow over time, don't worry. And the fear that people wouldn't turn up. And we ended up, I think, with 55 people in the room that first night. Nice. Honestly, it just, it was absolutely amazing. But yeah, I was bricking it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as well, lots of marketing agencies in the country hold hold their own meetups. You know, obviously you, you, you've partnered with the marketing meetup. Like, what are the benefits for, for agencies and for creatives for these kind of networking events? So, I mean, there's there's really clear benefits for, and, and you can see it in the fact there's so many people that choose to run this, whether it be part of the marketing meetup or independent. For us, the, the real benefit is we're associated with something brilliant. So mm. if we were to go tomorrow and say, right, we're just going to set up our own thing, you know, hi, we've just moved to the county, we don't know anyone. Um, it, it, we might be able to turn it into something. We're not bad at running events, but to turn up with the marketing meetup brand name behind it and the community definitely helped um, and with it we're associated with something that's positive and which is really attractive to our target market um, so we market primarily to marketers they're the people that that we work best with um, and yeah so I suppose it's that association which is where the value comes from yeah nice do you find more kind of agency owners and people that work in agencies at the marketing meetup or is it kind of a bit of both like in-house as well it's a really interesting split actually so it's different from location to location but generally the marketing meetups audience is about 20 percent freelancers and the remaining 80 percent are split out across both in-house and agency so okay. Each location is slightly different. I think TMM Northampton is slightly more in-house, which I think is representative of the county. Okay, nice. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you spoke about like the the meetups being kind of designed by introverts for like-minded people to to get networking and things like that, and it's a it's a safe space. Mm -hmm. Like, what does that look like in reality? How do you how do you bring that in? So. As a younger marketer, so I was an in-house marketer in my career earlier on, um, and I was trotted out to endless networking <laughs> events, endless networking events. I've done them all over the country. I've done exhibitions. And what I found was a lot of elevator pitches and big men in suits that had no interest in talking to me because I was junior and I didn't really have any buying power. And it felt rubbish. Like, it felt really, really rubbish. And what... I fell in love with with the marketing meetup and a number of other similar events that I've gone to in my later years um, was it, it didn't have that at all. It was about meeting people first and that's very much how I do business and how I like to be in business. Mm -hmm. It's there, There's a human behind everything and actually it, it, it's not about your buying power or yeah. droning into someone's ear about, you know, take my business card and buy this thing from me because my business is great. Um, and I think that opposite spin on it like let's meet the humans and see what comes from it is just a really beautiful thing yeah i mean we certainly know how to make the most of business cards they're currently used to prop up the table <laughs> <laughs> in front of us so again it probably shows how how good we are at networking yeah i mean well coming on to networking i suppose in a moment but just looking back at the kind of benefits and again like because we've discussed potentially like holding holding events in in the past until we notice like this marketing meetup at the Vulcan works like what does your business gain out of it do you gain is it networking opportunities to work with people is it is it leads as well yeah so it's definitely nothing that direct so my approach to business um was deliberately different to that I, I, I I've never been a salesperson I'm very much not a salesperson um so the the benefits that we have are indirect but clear so when we very first set up our business, we went to the first marketing meetup and then we went to a load of similar events. And I met interesting people who I got on with and then they referred someone to me and I referred someone to them, not because we're in some kind of culty networking, you know, we must refer leads, but because we got to know each other and trusted each other and felt safe passing our clients between each other because we knew each other would do a good job. And fast forward on to me now running a marketing meetup, it's the same, it's, it's the associated benefits. I'm never the kind of person that's going to stand there and say, you need to buy my stuff, I'm great. But I am going to introduce myself, make an effort to be really helpful to mm. you, get on with you, and that is naturally what produces all of our business. So can I ask you a question about overcoming barriers based on what you said there? So there's two things that you said that almost contradictory to what you now do, right? So you're not a salesperson, but you have to sell to keep the, the business thriving. Mm -hmm. And you're quite an introvert. You spent many an hour hiding in a toilet as 
I think we all have. Like, yeah. While you were talking, I was trying to, what's, what's the favourite toy that I've hidden in? <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of good ones at Hilton in, um, in London from memory. But, um, like, how do you overcome those barriers, like, to be able to sell or to be able to network? So, I, I think, firstly, like, the introvert-extrovert scale, I think, is a very interesting thing. Yeah. I, actually, I'm probably quite extroverted. The founder okay. was introverted. Um, but I think it depends on what environment I'm in. If mm. you put me in a traditional networking environment, it leaves me cold. I want to hide in the toilet. I'm nervous and I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and it's not a comfortable thing. Put me in a networking environment where I'm really comfortable, I'll talk your ear off. Mm. I, you know, and I'm quite happy standing up at the front of an event and chatting. So I think the introvert extrovert scale for me, I'm extrovert when I'm comfortable, okay. and so this is an environment yeah. I'm comfortable in. So mm. I, I seeked out where I'm comfortable to do my networking, and therefore I didn't have to sell. And as for selling as a business owner that doesn't like selling, I don't do it directly. I've never ever cold called for my business mm. i have never bought an exhibition stand space i have never sent out a cold email um i firmly believe and again i'm a small studio of two so i don't need as much business yeah, as a big sure. agency um but i firmly believe in reputation and referrals mm. and that is all i've done for the last six years and if i'm uncomfortable doing it i'm not going to do a good job yeah so so our business comes from reputation referrals. Yeah, I think that's been your big thing for, for this year, isn't it? You came in day one, what was that, January the 3rd or 4th of this year? Like, yeah. I was like, I'm going to be myself this year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a good idea or not. <laughs> okay. I think it's a brilliant idea. I think yeah. do more of that, you know, as a business owner, be more yourself. You know, as long as you're not an arse, then everyone's going to really like that authenticity. And yeah. I think that's that's where it all comes to from. To be fair, you have only known him for 20 minutes. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, mean, I suppose that's the whole reason why we've we've got you in on the podcast. Obviously, the podcast is about learning about interesting people, interesting businesses. But we also want to take something personally out yeah. of it. We want to learn as well. Um, we are, well, I am, you're close, the worst networkers in the world and as kind of new business owners we feel like we need to get better at networking um so much so we went to a trade show in london uh november time yeah i spent two hours just walking around the whole trade show in the excel psyching myself up to mm -hmm. go and talk to someone and when i did uh, it felt like hi i'm i'm, I'm brendan um I, I sell seo uh, talk to me like how do you do it how how do you network properly so I can, I can massively relate to that. Um, I have been trotted out at exhibitions repeatedly as a marketer and had to stand there and try and sell to people that are walking past, mm. which I promise you is an even harder pitch than trying to walk up to the stands I and bet. talk to them. Yeah. People do not want to be sold your <laughs> software product when they're not interested in it. So yeah. I, I really get that. Um, I think 90% of the secret is finding an environment that you're comfortable in, just like I was saying earlier on. Um, if you put me into a traditional networking environment, I'm not going to do well. Okay. If you seek out the ones that suit you and who you are, I think it's much more comfortable. Yeah. And as for tips to like getting more comfortable, it's like anything, it's like any muscle. The more you work it, the more comfortable it is. So you guys are quite happy sitting here recording a podcast. Mm. Uh, there are plenty of people that would, the first time they did that, sit down and shake and go, what the hell are we doing? And I'm sure in the amount of time you're, you've run it, you've improved, felt more comfortable, done better. And it really is like a muscle. So the way that I've approached it is I get the bravery up to walk up to people. And that is one of the hardest things. There's a, there's a gaggle of people that got there before you and they're in a circle and they're talking and you need to break your way into it. And the marketing meetup knows that and actually tries to make it a thing that it's okay just to walk into the middle of it and say hello. At other events, if you practice that there, you'll get more comfortable with it. And now I just bumble in. Hi, I'm Penny. What are you talking about? But I've been doing it for years and years and years. So it's supernatural. Um, and just take a really big interest. I think we're really good when we're nervous of I'm going to talk because I'm trying to make, you know, I, I'm interesting and I can join in and I'm worthy of joining your conversation. Um, but actually to really concentrate on listening and remembering who this person is that you've met and what's unique about them and what they're interested in and the next time you go to the same event and see them you could introduce them to someone that has the same hobby or you could you've gone off and tried a recipe that they mentioned it doesn't matter what it is but to take that real effort to focus in on another person 
and listen to them and learn something about them and then repeat that back to them in some way, I think is a gorgeous way to make people feel really comfortable with you and to actually take some value away from it. Nice. I mean, you're saying all of that, I'm like, oh, that sounds like a lot of work tonight because I'm going to challenge you, Harry, tonight. At, we're obviously going to go to the meetup tonight. Yeah. Like, I want us both to go off and, and talk to at least one other person whilst we're there and not shirk and hide by the walls and, like... I've already picked out my wall, though. <laughs> yeah. I know, but I've, we need to try it, don't we? we yeah, need we to get do, better for at sure. That. Yeah, so. I think the big thing is, because I was going to ask you, like, what's your opening line? Because I feel like words would come out of my mouth, but in no particular order. Well, here's my opening line to that one lady we met at the market, um, marketing meetup last time. So do you come here often? <laughs> I mean, why, why say that? Why say that? There's only been three of them. <laughs> I, know, I, know. I ask that every time. It's really yeah. comfortable. It just comes out your mouth. Yeah. Honestly, everyone's asking everyone that question. Yeah. So I think one of the first things I ask people, because you talk about like going up to new people, obviously it's a little bit more comfortable for me now because I'm a host, so there's a reason for me to be talking yeah. to you. Yeah. You know, and no longer is it like I'm just a randomer who's trying to come up. So I, mm. I do have that advantage. But I think one of the first things I ask everyone that comes in, is this your first time or have you been before? Because it's just a really easy first thing to say. So I think there's nothing wrong with that. And it starts oh. conversation. Okay. Um, She's I, been nice there, isn't she? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, and I don't think I have a line. I don't, I, you yeah. know, it, it's not speed dating. Just say hello. And also know everyone is just as uncomfortable as you are. Yeah. Our palms yeah. are sweating. Our hearts are thumping we're all in an uncomfortable situation but it feels really good afterwards if you've done it mm. so put yourself through it know you're going to stumble over your words and actually it just makes you more human and more likable as a result yeah fair um any more questions on networking i'm just trying to think as to i'm gonna i'm, <laughs> I'm gonna film you for tiktok no <laughs> oh my god that will add the pressure there like yeah. We're no. trying to get big on TikTok. That's our that's our thing for today. Well, you're trying. You're the TikTok man. I'll <laughs> stick to LinkedIn. LinkedIn I'm more man. comfortable yeah, yeah, with yeah. that. Oh, yeah. LinkedIn's my comfort space. Yeah. I made myself do a video yesterday. Funnily enough, first time I've ever just picked up the phone, talked at it, not not practice, not properly yeah. done, just chatted at the video and put it up. And that was really hard. Yeah, like, it is. I, I, it's an age thing, right? Like, I, I'm gonna guess you guys are roughly around about the same place as me. I didn't grow up with video being something I could record on my phone as a teenager. Yeah. And so it's, it's a big thing, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I, actually, that's a really good point. Like, initially at the start of this, we talked about being authentic. Like, for you, picking up the phone and recording a video, that must be quite daunting. It, it, it is for me. How, how can we present our most authentic self if we're doing stuff like that that makes us really uncomfortable? Well, I think you are presenting your most authentic self because it's off the cuff and uncomfortable, yeah. right? What's more authentic than catching yourself and making yourself do that? Sitting and polishing it and editing it and everything that comes with it, that's less authentic. Okay. So I'd argue making yourself do it and just being <laughs> off the cuff is, is, is a more authentic version. Fair, okay, yeah. like it. Yeah. Cool. Um, anything else? No, I don't marketing so. meetup? No. Okay, we'll switch uh, attention. Oh, I'm touching my mic there. Um, is it Cabo? It's Cabo, but Cabo. everyone pronounces it differently. So no Cabo, okay. <laughs> Fair. So Cabo Creative, do you want to give us a rundown on your growth journey over the past six six or seven years? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it was this crazy idea that, so the name, um, we were on a beach called Cabo Verde. Nice. And we decided we were going to do this thing that we talked about for years and never done. So we mm. create, came up with Cabo Creative because, you know, unique naming. But also you guys are like this. I figured we could rank in search because it was K-A-B-O and that, that word doesn't exist. So Cabo Creative. Um we're very much a studio of two. Uh, we weren't sure in the early days whether it was, oh, we grow this into a thing or we stay as a studio of two. And it's something that we really, really enjoy doing as in that little kind of bubble. So essentially we're two freelancers under one brand. Um, and the growth journey, I mean, early years, it was a real scrabble. And over the years, we've built up a reputation, had more clients on our books, and found that referrals come through more, more easily. And so it's become more of a comfortable, stable thing, with the exception of COVID throwing the world upside down, and mm. then 2023 being the year that all agencies and studios found that leads dropped off. Um, but I think we're used to the, the up and downs that come with this kind of life now. Yeah, nice. So um, let's start at the beginning then. Like... Can you remember how you acquired your first first clients? Was it people you knew or was it 
doing something that, that brought them through the door? So the very first client, because you need to start somewhere when you're setting up a business, was our plasterer. Okay, um, nice. And he gave us a bit of plastering. We got him a website, first one on the portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <nice. laughs> so there we go. Um, from there, the early clients were very much, and I suppose this would make sense for me, from networking. And uh, that was both online and in person. So our second ever client, we met their freelance digital marketer in a Facebook group for freelancers, and they're still with us today. Um, so yeah, very, very much so early stage leads were either in person or online networking. Fair. And now fast forward six years, how, how do you gain your clients now? Is it a whole mix match of like inbound, outbound? How do you do it? So um, entirely inbound. Okay. Um, but I mean, it depends with the equal networking inbound. So we meet people and then that tends to turn into business. The vast majority of our work now is referral. Um, so we've got a client bank. And again, it's the beauty of being a studio of two. You don't need 100 leads to keep a studio of two busy. You need a few good ones every now and then. Um, so we're very picky with our clients. And we tend to have more coming in than we require, which is a really mm. gorgeous place to be. But yeah, referral, networking, nothing else. Nice. And I think we probably missed one crucial detail as well, which is... Uh what does your studio do? <laughs> yeah, you see, I'm rubbish at yeah. that. Yeah, you. sorry, that's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> no, sorry. No, I'm sure I should yeah, know yeah. that. I'm all for the assumed, but yeah. Um, so, we're Cabaret Creative is a two person studio. It's myself and my lovely wife. I'm the developer and she's the designer. So, the bulk of our work is designing and building WordPress websites. And we have around the interim, you know, a bit of extra branding work, um, mm. it, it, all of the standard design work. So, you know, we can do your business cards and your stationery and, I don't know, estate agents, boards whatever might come with that brilliant okay um this question is from from us and our previous experience we used to work back in the day at a web development agency and knowing the stress when it comes up to deadlines with websites launching and stuff like that and the hours that sometimes you've got to plow into a new website a how do you keep things on time and b how do you keep it profitable so it's the same answer to both of them, and I've learned this the hard way. It's not like I, on day one, was getting this right. It's scoping. So scoping is my biggest secret, and I think, I know, we are much more intense on our scoping process than most others that we come across. Um, so the scoping process with us will be intense, and at the end of it, the client will know exactly what they're getting. We will know exactly how it's going to be built. And it gives us a really powerful way of knowing when it's scope brief and when it's part of the brief because we we have it all written down really thoroughly what is and isn't included. So we know how we're going to build it, what it's going to be, exactly the functionality that's going to be in it and integrated with it. And over six years, we've got to the point that we deliver on time and very rarely have an awkward conversation to have. It doesn't mean it never happens. Things yeah. can come up. Um, but yeah, we stay within what we know and we scope unbelievably thoroughly. Nice, nice. Um, okay, so that's the kind of day job of what you do. But how do you two both kind of manage the studio, as you call it, and the marketing, the sales, the delivery, the operations, the finances? The many, many hats yeah. for yeah. a small business. Yeah, and there are many, many hats. Yeah. Um, so our number one focus is always on delivery you know client projects is above and beyond anything else that's going on because if we if we don't deliver a good project on time with a happy client everything else is gone and it's pointless um everything else so marketing i have tried so hard to be consistent with this over six years <laughs> i'll come up with the plans i'll commit to them for two months but i think i'm an entrepreneurial spirit i do everything really hard for a short period of time and then i drop it it's just who i am um, and also, like when the client work is a little bit quieter, you can really do the marketing. Yeah. Whereas when the client work is really, really busy, it's really hard to do it. Um, so we're trying to police ourselves. We Last year, we put together a social media plan for the first time ever in six years <laughs> yeah. and are actually sticking to it. It's lasted past my two month window. Nice. Actually, like nice. Thing, nice. So winning. Um, and marketing beyond that, to be fair, I run the marketing meetup and that's I go to some networking events and that is marketing. So yeah. there's, there's not too much more to do beyond that sales as i've said i mean i'll have sales calls uh with leads that come to me but i don't go out there and look for them so there isn't anything to do there i don't have time to do that um and all the general admin of the business i mean i do it when it needs to be done 
You know, at the end of the day, you have to submit your tax returns and answer your accountant's questions. There are certain things that must be done, but client work will always push it to the side if it needs to be. Fair. Because I think for me, obviously, we're about seven months into our own yeah. journey. Um, we'll come on to prioritisation in, in a moment, which I think, and focus, which is one area we've constantly talked about. And running a business on from that respect is hard. But how do you shift your mindset to kind of like, it, it feels like from your answer just then, you're almost like, well, as long as the clients are happy, the rest will just kind of follow suit. And it's kind of, you know, it's not like a, I don't know what the word is to, to say. It's fluid, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, I, I how do you get into that? It's, I think it's just experience. I, yeah. You know, we, we've been doing this for six years. When you've been doing any job for six years, you get really comfortable with it. Um, but also, ultimately we stand and fall with our clients so that is where my focus is so i'm best in the mornings i get up in the morning nothing is being done that isn't project work because i know i'm full of energy at that point and then later in the afternoon when i know my brain's exhausted and i cannot write another line of code and i don't <laughs> want to touch that anymore well actually that's a really good time to do all the admin of the business or to do those social media posts or you know all of the other things that come into it so i think it's whatever's most important give it your best and whatever isn't, do when you're a bit, bit less, you know, energetic. I, like, I, I really like that because, again, like the past seven months for me and you, it's been finding our feet and kind of understanding what our focus is. Like, and you said it before in your answer, like, yeah, well, I'll, I've drawn up like a, a LinkedIn posting plan, like good two, three months worth of posts, lasted a week. And then we'd already switch focus onto something mm. else. Like, mm -hmm. how do you keep the focus? Um, I've come to accept that there are ebbs and flows in the amount of focus that you can give. So I think being willing to forgive yourself for not being able to give 110% every day for 365 days a year is half the secret. Um, so I'll have great days where I can work till 8 o'clock because I'm in something and it's really appealing. And then the next day I'm knackered and I finish at 3. So I think the most important th thing for me about focus is work when you're good and really give yourself permission to rest when you're not because that means you'll be good again the next day um and prioritizing i mean there's always a million priorities that the thing is there's always going to be if you own a business that, that there's always only ten thousand priorities you can probably only focus on three at any one time so you're going to have to put them in an order list run with it for a week or two and then look at your list again fair fair i like that and uh, <laughs> You're not in a unique position, but one that's quite interesting in terms of you work day in, day out with your wife. Like, A, how do you maintain a work-life balance? And B, you know, are there arguments and stuff like that? Because if I worked with my wife, we'd probably be divorced by now. I mean, um, we're bad so, enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. How do you do it? Um, you know, we get this question a lot. Like, it's a proper, like, you, you work with you. What is this? Although there are others that do it. Yeah. It's certainly a fascination point for people yeah. that don't. Um, so when we decided, right, we think we want to work together, we decided to test it with trial by fire. Let's not just, you know, see what this does and whether it peters out. We rented out our house, started the business and took a one way ticket to Bali. And we nice. spent a year traveling around Southeast Asia and bootstrapping this business. Um, and if you want to test whether you can handle being with someone 24 <laughs> seven, go get dengue fever when you've got a client project due. Go travel through the night to find that the place you were going to rent doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, put yourself into like culture shock in Cambodia while you're trying to build a business. And that, that extreme set of circumstances, by the time we came back a year later with a fledgling business, we'd, we'd put ourselves through so much of the stress that running it at home is really, really comfortable. You know, it's easy. And I think it's also down to what kind of couple you are. Um, so I've been with Joe for just under half of my life. Um, okay. So we, we, I think I met her when I was 18. We were together from when I was 19. So for me, if you get to choose your co-worker, I, I'd pick her. She's my favourite person. She's always been part of my life. And I think we just accept that work and life are completely intermingled in every single mm. way. And we enjoy the madness. Nice. I, I like it's that. like me and you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we are finding that. Like, we haven't... We don't argue necessarily. You try to argue. Yeah. But in terms of... Are there any kind of mechanisms you've got in place during the workday, like feedback mechanisms or anything like that, that you can kind of have honest 
conversations. I think that's the fascination okay, point. So right? it, it's not it's not like you know, oh, we just agree with everything because actually yeah. we'd be really bad business partners yeah. if we did. Um, so there's, I think there's one main secret is we do not do the same thing. And mm. I think in any business as co-founders, you need to have you have to come together sometimes but actually dividing and conquering is the big secret and having faith in each other to do a good job so our office our desks are back to back and most okay. of our working day we're just heads down doing what we need to do okay. when it comes to anything joint take a deep breath take a step back you know so when we design a site joe designs it I kind of put the brief together, she does the design, then I come in as the developer, and you guys will know from your past experience, put a designer and a developer around. <laughs> That's what I was going to say, In front of yeah. a beautiful design that the designer is in love with, and the client will obviously love, and have the developer go, can't do that, can't do that, what the hell are you doing with this? We do that with every project. Um, we take breaks, we take deep breaths, and we make sure that we leave enough time in the project to be able to say, okay, it's time to put this down for today and we'll come back to it tomorrow. But it's the same relationship you have in an agency with designers and developers. Yeah. Just because you're yeah. the co-founders and you're close doesn't mean sometimes you just have to take a step away, right? Yeah, brilliant. Um, okay, moving on slightly then. Um, uh, there's so many questions I want to ask about your journey and kind of going abroad and all of, G all give of us that. A, give us a horror story. Yeah, that's what I want. I want all the low light. <laughs> Of your journey oh so far. Oh god, I mean there were plenty. So we got married just before we went. We did everything all at once. So we got married and then a I week said later. Nothing was half day. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, no, we decided let's change our whole life in one go. Business, marriage, flight. Um, and so we got there and had a two-week honeymoon, which was chintzy, gorgeous, and amazing. And we'd booked our first accommodation for the next one. We had clients waiting for us to come back from this honeymoon. And we wander over in Bali from the five-star accommodation kind of area to the where you can live for about $5 a night. Um, and there was water running through the roof, and we could see fleas on the floor. And it was wow. booked, and we had nowhere else to live, and we had to go to work that day. And I mean, it was, it was a shack, essentially. Mm. Oh, an Airbnb, it looked nice enough. Okay. And so we walked in 80% humidity and unbelievable temperature for eight hours with our laptops on our backs and a suitcase holding a year's worth of possessions trying to find a house while finding internet anywhere we could to keep our clients thinking we're working. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was fun. Yeah. Um, and the next one was when we got dengue fever. Like, that was miserable. Dengue fever is called breaking bones for a reason. It yeah. was... I, we were in agony, fever, miles from home. We were on an island where there wasn't a doctor. Like, it was insane. But we had our biggest client project due. Like, the money that was going to keep us going for the next six months was due. And we had to pull it off in delirium. I don't really know how we did it. But it was it was rubbish, really rubbish. Uh, that strikes of, like, the perseverance. I think agency owners and, and small business owners sometimes, like... There's no off day when you, when you own your own business. Have, have there been other times in your journey that you've just been like, you've got to get through it, even though you'd take a back seat, ideally, and just like sit it out? I think that sums it up really well. When you're a business owner, the business rides or fails with you. And so if you've committed yourself to things and letting that go will mean that you end up in a really bad position with the client, you could kill your business. You know, your reputation matters. Um, I've learned over the years to not put myself in that position. So deadlines are extended beyond what they actually need. Because I, I think my instinct is to go, yes, of course, I can do that as quickly as you want. And of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that's okay and no problem. Yeah. But actually, if you tell the client it's going to take longer, uh, under, -promise, uh, under promise, over deliver, and you deliver it sooner, that's great. But at the same time, if you get COVID halfway through the project, which let's face it, is part of modern life, you can take that week you need to get back to full strength. And so I think... Under-promising and over-delivering in all aspects is the way that you can give yourself the room, if possible. Um, and sometimes you just have to work with dengue fever and humidity because you screwed yourself over and your business will die if you don't push through, I guess. That was definitely us in the early days. Yeah. I can remember being on the phone to someone be like, yeah, two hours for that seems yeah, reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Hop across to the developer room. Go, oh, yeah, we've got to do this now. But yeah, that's like two weeks worth of work. I'm yeah. Like, Brendan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I've committed now, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to have to take that hit and I'm going to have to run off and get more client work to pay for the fact that my, you know, that's, that's two yeah. weeks and we're not going to get paid for it yet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's, that's, Let's flip it though. Highlights. What's the thing you're most proud of in the six years? Oh, try and pick one thing over six years. Um, honestly, I think I'm most proud of the fact that we, as this 
couple that lives in our home and runs a business from it manages to build websites for the clients that we do that mm. brings them the benefits that it does like we have so the marketing meets up with one of our clients and have been for a number of years and the way they've grown and the fact that we've got to be part of yeah. that and we've done that from our little home office just me and joe it's mad absolutely insane we have another one who um they used to run a traveling uh, steam fair that had like equipment from the 1800s and they traveled all the way around the country. And it was this huge, amazing, like unbelievable business. And because we were there behind them making all the tech work, they were able to do this thing. And I, I, I think it's, it's that, it's being able to be a part of something so big, just us two sitting yeah. in our little home office, it's mad. <laughs> um, goals, A, do you believe in goals? And B, what are your goals for this year and, and for the future? Hmm, do I believe in goals? I mean, it, yes, but in a certain way. So, I mean, I've been a marketer, you know, you get like smart goals and you get these goals and that <laughs> yeah, goals yeah. and all of the rest of it. They don't work for me. That doesn't mean they don't work. But for me, I go into like deep dive, like, all right, what's the S and what's the M and what is this? And mm. I can lose a day to building a goal and then it's unattainable anyway because I've made it fit the model. Yeah. Um, so I have where I want to be. And I revise that and I take a step back and make sure that I take a few days out of the business every now and then to make sure I still want to be going there and we're still working towards it. Um, but definitely not anything massively specific. Yeah. It's much looser and I think I can afford that because, again, we're a two-person business. I think if you've got 100 people, it's very different. Um, and as for goals for 2024... So for Cabo, it's do more of the same. We really love the business that we have. We really love the clients that we have. We're in a really good place and it's taken us a while to get there. So keep working with really lovely people and enjoy them. Um, and for beyond that, we're very early stage. We've loved running the marketing meetup and we have an idea for a new event that we're, we're in the planning stage and I can't say more about. But Fair. There's definitely something we really enjoy doing there and would like yeah. to do more of. That's one of my favourite yes. things to do, is if I can see somebody like setting some KPIs or something on the laptop, I just sure. go, okay. but is it smart? <laughs> you can see them turn around and like, I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so when talking about your goals as well, you, you mentioned that it's where you want to be, kind of where you see yourself. Like, how do you visualise yourself in, in a certain time period? Is it like, oh if I see myself at this point in my journey, like, what does that actually look like? I mean, it's constantly changing. So when we very first set up the business, the goal was survive the year. You know, at, at, at that point, yeah, that's what it like is. Yeah, like me this year. <laughs> it, it is, like early yeah. stage it very much is. And then it was all right. So we'd now like to survive three years, but actually we're not enjoying this element of how we're working and we'd like to work with more than that kind of client. And it it's really is that loose. And then it's, it's about, we're a couple that runs a business. It's about going to the pub, stopping work early and having a chat and being like, all right, so who are the clients we want to work with? What could we do to put that into action? Let's look at it again in six months and try and do that. Um, and so it really is as loose as that. And it's making sure we're profitable and we're enjoying running the business that we do. And they're the two things we're constantly making sure it fits. And that changes, I think, every year, you know, over time. So how do you manage kind of like two people's workload in terms of sometimes you're probably bound to have like three or four website projects for instance like do you have to space them out or can, do you say like oh yeah yeah we can do it and then figure out a way of doing it so early days again and when i say early days i'm talking like the first three years not just <laughs> yeah. in the first three months yeah. um yes yes we can do that yes yes no problem oh god how am i going to pull this off yeah. Oh, no, it's midnight and I'm still working. So that was very much what we did. Again, experience is a beautiful thing. I do not run more than two website projects at once. Full stop, non-negotiable. Because two, I can be in it for the clients. But also, as our business has grown, we have continuous clients that we've already built a site for them. But actually, there's regular reasons they need support from us to change things, add things deliver training to a new member of team whatever it might be so we, i mean we have easily a couple of days work a week one to two that is just regular client work which only leaves three to get the work done you yeah. know three to four so two private client projects are my absolute limit and if i can they're staggered but you can't control clients Fair. so they're not always do you get any times when i suppose that almost 
scarcity is a good thing when you're talking to a potential client and you're like, oh yeah, we can do this, but it's going to be three months before we can start. Are they like, oh no, we'll, we'll pay you extra or whatever it is to, to get their website in the queue? It's really tough. This, this is one of the hardest things. This is one of the things that made us debate whether we wanted to scale and then we chose against it because there's nothing that sucks more than when a lead comes in that you want and you like them and it's your kind of thing. But you have to say, I'm booked out and I'm not going to be able to fit you in until X and they go away because it's too long. And that does happen to us. Um, and equally the other way around, when the work dries up and you're like, ah, oh, shoot, you know, we could do some more people coming in. Um, we don't let them pay more to jump the queue because that's not how we operate. And if they really want to work with us, they'll wait. More often than not, they do. Um, but it depends how big the queue is. So, you know, when the queue gets to a certain size, people stop working with us and that's fine and they go off and find someone else. But again, we only need so much work. So as long as yeah. we've got a couple in the queue at any one time, it kind of all works out. Yeah, perfect. Um, that's all my questions, Harry. Any yeah, questions no. Me? Anything else you want to talk about? No. I mean, it's been really lovely to chat with you guys. I've really enjoyed it. Good. Perfect. Nice. Well, we hope tonight goes really well for you and that the marketing meetup continues to be and a success. And you'll see us working the room. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, pros, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be watching you guys now so you can go to it and I, be comfortable. Yeah, exactly. You're going to be coming up to us and be like, Get out there and talk. <laughs> talk. Oh, okay. I'll be nicer. I'll bring you into the service. Yeah, okay. That'd be nice. Well, anyway, thank you once again so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun. Good. Nice. Cheers. Harry, how do you feel that podcast with Penny went? Yeah, I think it was a good one. First one, obviously, it might not come in chronological order, but the, yeah. the first one in the new studio. And I think it went very well. I think credit to to penny she's a very good talker and she took us on a very good. good like journey of the story of you know how she started how they found working together over the last six years the the horror stories if you like the low lights um, what was your main takeaway i think with penny as much as like previous episodes with uh matt b with phil and stuff it's that kind of understanding from other business owners they're, they're not as stressed as kind of like sometimes I feel you almost have to be stressed to run a business but you don't they take it in their stride a lot and I got that impression from Penny a lot in the ways that she's talking about the the formalities that we've kind of discussed not that we do it but like marketing plans or like setting goals or looking at spreadsheets all of that Penny was very good at just being like Oh, it's, we kind of understand from experience we'll just ride the wave and I like that yeah I think maybe that's a good segue into what we're trying to achieve with season 2 of building though in the sense that obviously we may have had a few other podcasts out in that time as well but you got to remember where those people are in their life cycles as business owners right like also I love how Matt B is Matt B like as if you're a Brendan G yeah, no, yeah. we just know Matt B so yeah. it's just Matt B all, exactly. all the time but like, if you look at where they are in their life cycles with their businesses it'd be interesting to be able to go back to like that first year or you know the first couple of years or during that first growth cycle yeah. to see what the different emotions were at those different times so it will be really interesting to see as we have more guests lined up who are maybe not as established maybe still in that survival mode of the first year or the first couple of months is to yeah, how those life cycles of stress and, I guess, excitement and despair, whatever it may be, how they balance themselves out. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. We're going to probably be more biased towards those kind of stories in the first year of a growth journey because we're there. We're yeah. there right now. So hearing how other people in different industries and sectors have got over that first mm. year kind of bump, like, to see that because... There's some stats out there. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but it's kind of like if businesses are to fail, they tend to fail in the first year. Yeah. So if you make it out the first year, you're golden in a sense. And I think we're well on that, that way, but it's interesting. Now we're almost switching tact as well as a business in terms of we're going from that survival period into the growth and the scaling part of our journey. Yeah, I'd say like... How do I say this? The, since the turn of the years, we're moving into 2024, like I've definitely seen that change within you. Like you seem to have switched a bit from 
defensive to offensive in your ways of thinking. Like obviously, Ooh, a very American football of you. I like it. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I don't really like American football, but the the, the, the Chiefs are playing the Bills this weekend. So we Go Bills. Absolutely not. <laughs> I know one player from the Chiefs, therefore I'm a Chiefs fan. Nah, Josh oh. Allen. Anyway, it's a not massive, an NFL massive, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <yeah. laughs> Maybe one day. Yeah. Um, but what was I... I've lost... What, what was I talking about? Oh, the change oh, in you. Yeah, 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 so you've definitely gone more offensive with your ways of thinking, like through to the fact that like we're sat here now, we're investing into things, we're putting money where we think our big bets are for the year. So, yeah, I've seen that change in you as the business has evolved in its life cycle as well yeah and i want to switch back to penny obviously it's penny's Mm. um podcast but it's also these bits that i'm starting to probably enjoy more than the day job this is almost a fun part of the job and it serves a purpose much like what we discussed with penny in terms of you know penny organizes and runs a marketing meetup in northampton and trying to understand from Penny like the the benefits of doing that, like what what's good for her business, why she does it, and understand because it kind of helps us understand why we're doing certain bits, like getting people like Penny on mm. our podcast as well. Yeah, and I think that's probably a great point to end on, which is a couple of hours time. What time is it now? We're recording this, so one forty six. So in four or five hours, we're going to be in the room that Penny was talking about doing networking so when this episode does come out along with this episode i will also share some footage of brendan working the room using his opening lines he's been working on for the last four hours for everyone to witness a master class in networking is what i'm expecting well i'm going to do the same to you as well because i don't think you're too far behind me when it no, comes i think to i'm worse i don't think i don't think oh, I, don't know. And I can't even drink this time so it's going to be carded i know yeah um well, we'll just see how that goes. But anyway, once again, um, massive thank you to Penny. Um, that's, again, collaborating with people we didn't know kind of three, yeah. four, four months ago. Penny's done um, us a great favour by joining us on the podcast. So, yeah, hopefully our paths will cross again in the future. Are we still doing the outros in season two? Uh, yeah, are we... Yeah? I think so. You have to look down an actual camera and do it this time. Okay. Swing well, but true. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Building. If you did, please like, share and subscribe.